Longtime church attenders may recognize I borrowed the title from my brief address this morning from one of the more popular hymns of the 20th century. It was written in the early 1900s by a Presbyterian pastor from New York City who saw God doing a great burgeoning, growing work in the men's ministry of his own church. This hymn, labeled Rise Up, O Men of God, encourages men of all ages to rise up, to have done with lesser things, and to rise up to serve the King of Kings. The second verse of that great hymn admonishes men to bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of wrong. The third verse reminds us that your church, and may I say Emmanuel Baptist Church, is not exempt from what this hymn calls the great challenges, and we are called as men of God to rise up and make her, rise up and make the church great. The fourth stanza of the hymn says, Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where His feet have trod, and as brothers of the Son of Man, rise up, O men of God. Now this hymn's emphasis on men's ministry bothers the inclusivists of our day. I'm talking about the powder puff men who buy their pink and purple jeans at the Gap moderates and spiritual pansies who would change the lyrics of this song from rise up, O men of God, to rise up, O church of God, rise up, O saints of God, although there's nothing wrong with calling the church or the saints to rise up. Far too many in our day find the call for men to rise up as men of God to be too chauvinistic, too too narrow, too misogynistic for this gender-fluid culture. We live in a day where even in the American church, we're we're constantly blurring the lines of distinction between men and women. Now, I didn't come to get off on this topic this morning, but even in our own Southern Baptist Convention, we're seeing an increasing number of women preachers, and many of them are preaching in our own Baptist Bible colleges. And just this week, if you follow social media, there was a dust-up because a Baptist pastor in Utah posted something about God's biblical call for women to dress in modesty. And he was predictably attacked by the pagans in our godless culture. But what surprised many is that he was attacked by bossy women and spiritually effeminate men who think that it's wrong for a man to be visibly attracted to a woman. To which I want to say, cut the lace off your BVDs, get you some Levi's from the men's department, turn in your women's study Bible, and rise up, O men of God. Now, now, now some would ask, what are the ladies supposed to sing? If the church is gathered and we're singing, rise up, O men of God, I say that godly women of all ages would do well to sing that song too. And I'm convinced that there are some wives and there are some mothers and there are some sisters and there are some daughters who are at home right now praying, Rise up, O men of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. David is moved by the Spirit of God and by royal concern and and obviously by parental love, the love of a father for a son that on his deathbed, He calls his son to his side and says, I want to give you a charge. Some of my final words, son, rise up as a man of God. There are three simple things that I want to bring out of this text this morning. You didn't think a Baptist preacher would have any fewer than three things, did you? Note with me as we just examine these four verses that the context involves solitude. For the text begins in chapter 2 as David's time to die drew near. David is on his deathbed. And our vernacular hospice has probably been in the royal palace for a couple of weeks and they're starting to call the family in. Word is going out to all of Solomon's brothers and sisters that if you want to see your daddy before he dies, you better get to the palace right away. David is actually going to be dead before the chapter really gets going. I think it's down in verse 10 that he steps from this life and the life to come. And as the nurses around the bed, if you please, are calling the family in, David takes a moment to send all of the family out. And like a scene from the Godfather series, he calls Solomon to his bedside and he says, I want to, I want to tell you some things about being a man of God. I want to talk to you about what it means to rightfully rule this kingdom. 
and to walk in the ways of the Lord your God. And the context of this instruction involves solitude because he says, Solomon, you can tell by my own physical condition you are about to be on your own. And there's going to come a time in the life of every man, I don't care if you're here today, you're six, or if you're 96, there's going to come a time that you're going to be on your own and you're going to have to decide, are you going to stand strong and prove yourself to be a man of God? There will come a day that mama's faith and daddy's convictions won't help you. It may not be when your daddy dies. It may be when your daddy dies, but it may be when your daddy drops you off in a university a campus and you've got to go into the dorm room by yourself and determine what am I going to be when it's nobody but me and God. It may be as soon as this later this morning when you get back home. You may not be in life on your own. You may just be in your bedroom alone and you think that nobody sees and nobody knows and the question is going to come in that moment where you can't lean on anybody else, depend on anybody else. Will you stand strong and prove yourself to be a man? Now this man David knew what it was like to stand for God when nobody else would. One of the first things that we learn about him is when all of Israel is hiding in the caves and the king is hiding out in the back of his tent, David shows up with a sack lunch for his brothers and wants to know why nobody is standing strong and proving themselves to be a man of God. David stood in solitude in the valley against Goliath. David stood in solitude when he danced with the Ark of the Covenant coming into Jerusalem, had to face the ire and the scorn of his own wife and basically said uh, that, that uh, I didn't dance for you. I'm dancing for an audience of one. But I don't have to remind this crowd this morning, David also knew what it was like to have a massive sinful failure in his life because he thought nobody else was around that nobody else would know. And if you know your Bible and your Israeli history, you'll know Solomon is in line to be the king because Amnon and Absalom are already dead because of the consequences of David's sin, a sin that he committed when he thought nobody else was around. And once again, brothers of all ages, you too will soon be in a place of solitude by yourself at work, at school, at college, in marriage, or just simply by yourself in your truck, in your car, in a deer stand. And I charge you today by the word of God that like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel stood for God against the rest of the culture. Stand strong and prove yourself a man. If you're going to be ready to stand for God, you better gird your loins and be ready to stand, if necessary, to stand alone. The context involves solitude. But secondly, and I'm just trying to move as quickly as possible, the command involves Scripture. David charged his son Solomon saying, verse 2, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong therefore and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways. And then in the third verse, David just empties a thesaurus of synonyms to describe what you and I would simply know as the Word of God. Now if you read the rest of the chapter, David gives practical instructions to his soon-to-be king son. He gives him royal advice about ruling the kingdom. David has learned some things about some men who live in the nation of Israel, and, and it really is like a scene out of The Godfather. If you ever watched that movie, can you imagine Marlon Brando on his deathbed? Michael, watch out for Bozzini. You can read here in the balance of this chapter, he's saying, Solomon... I've never told you all the secrets of the throne. But watch out for this one. He'll stab you in the back. I know you think that this one is a friend of our family, but he's not a friend of our family. Do not let him go to his grave in peace. And Solomon, no matter what else you do, this one has been very, very loyal and good to me. Whatever you do in the kingdom, make sure that you take care of him and all of his descendants. So there is a place for a godly man to give his son practical insight about living in this world. I say without apology, there is a place to teach them how to hunt and to fish and to water ski and snow ski. There is a place. I say it's a godly place to tell your son how to wire an outlet, how to hang a ceiling fan, how to replace a faucet. There's going to come a day you're not going to have money to call an electrician, to call a plumber, and a godly woman wants a man who knows how to do a few things. There's nothing wrong, there's much right with teaching them the right way to mow the grass. There, and if you live with my daddy, you know there's a right way and there's a wrong way. 
to mow the grass, to trim the shrubs, to paint the baseboard. But the primary task of being a man of God is to instill the Word of God into their life. It's worth noting the first thing out of his mouth, son, lean in close, your daddy is about to die. And I want to beg you, learn the word of God, live the word of God, and learn to love the God of that word. Now the command is found in verse 2, stand and prove yourself a man. But in verses 3 and 4, he begins to flesh out what that looks like. Standing and proving yourself a man is not proven primarily at the gym. You prove it in Sunday school. You don't prove biblical manhood under the hood of a truck. You prove it on Sunday night when you get up from your afternoon nap and make yourself and your family get your way back to the house of God because we've got choir at 445 for all of the children. We've got teachers meetings and Bible studies going on and the man of God's going to preach and the saints of God are going to sing and the church of the living God is going to gather. You don't prove biblical manhood merely by rising up early to go to work. Now that's one way to do it but not by rising early to go to work but by rising early to get in the word. Now here there's specific reference. Son, I want you to go back and live your life learning and loving and fleshing out the testimonies, the statutes, the ordinances, the ways of God. We can't be dogmatic about this point, but as David is about to die, I wonder if he said, Solomon, when you get through reading those, those what we have is the first five books of our Bible, the, the writings of Moses. Son, if you'll, if you'll go look in the top of my dresser drawer, in the back on the left-hand side, is a little song book that I've been writing. And, and I want you to study my own personal diary. And turn over to the 18th page and you'll read, I love you, O Lord, my strength. You're my source, my stronghold forever. On page 19 of my hymn book, you ought to live your life saying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Son, I want you to be strong and show yourself a man of God. Page 21 of my songbook says, The king shall have joy in the strength of the Lord. And Solomon, you're going to face the dark night of the soul, and you need to know that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? This commandment to prove yourself to be a man of God for Solomon and for each of us involves a systematic study of the Word of God. Now, In the next several months, we're going to be having some men's Bible studies, many of them on Monday evenings, just an hour long each night, four to six weeks in length. We realize that we are busy men and just short term and short length of commitment. Why? Because proving yourself to be a man of God involves a lot of things, but preeminently it involves the Son of God and the Word of God. Now in his capacity as Minister of Education, Brother Richard will say more about the Word of God in just a moment, so let me move on quickly. The context involves solitude. The command involves Scripture. Finally, the consequence involves success. Verse 4, so that, or the end of verse 3, that you may succeed... And all you do wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise. And this is the promise. God had said to David, if your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. And by the way, that was part of what we would call the Davidic covenant. And if you don't know your Bible well, you may, think that, you may think that this promise was not fulfilled. This promise was ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. To whom God would give the throne of his father David, and he would sit on that throne and reign over the house of Jacob forever and forever. And of his glorious kingdom there shall be no end. The consequence of proving yourself Solomon and Emmanuelites and our guests, the consequence of proving yourself as a man of God is to be successful in the sight of God. Now, every man in this room wants his sons to be successful. My two sons are here this morning. Every man wants to be successful. 
Every daddy wants his sons to be successful. Do we have any grandpas in the room? Wave at me this morning. You want your sons' sons and your sons' daughters to be successful. Not just successful in the ways of the world. Yes, you want them to have a good job. Yes, you want them to have nice things. Yes, you want them to have all of their needs met. But most importantly, you want them to be successful in the eyes of God. It has been rightly said that the only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary. But brothers, even in the dictionary, success follows obedience. Solomon, I want to charge you to obey the Word of God so that you will be successful in everything you do, everywhere you go. I've taught this congregation on many occasions that the only standard by which success as a Christian is measured is obedience. Not how high you've climbed on the ladder, Not how successful you are in your career. Not how many degrees you have from the college, the university, or the graduate school. Papa Sam Cathy is the first one that I ever heard say that you could have more degrees than a thermometer and not be right with God. Success as a Christian is ultimately measured by one standard, one rubric, one yardstick alone. Have I been obedient to God? Years ago, I'd been contacted by a pulpit committee. Now, congregations don't like to hear about their preacher. Well, well, some congregations would love to hear about their preacher being contacted by a pulpit committee, and they're praying, even so, Lord Jesus, come. (laughs) Well, this was probably 10, 11 years ago. I'd been contacted by a pulpit committee, and I, though I was happy and fulfilled, since the call of God on my life in the ministry here, it's always been my practice to pray about those things and just sense what the Lord is up to. Now, most of you in this room will never be contacted by a pulpit committee, but it may be a job offer. It may be some other opportunity. But I will say this, after wrestling through that, and I couldn't get a yes, I couldn't get a no from the Lord, and you've been in that situation in your life, just don't know which, which way to go. I went back into my shop in my backyard, and I knelt down, in the sawdust. And this was my prayer. Lord, I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know where you want me to serve. I just don't know. But I submit to you. I'll go anywhere. I'll be anything. I'll do anything you want from me. All I want to know, Lord, what do you want from me? And I sense the Holy Spirit answer with one resounding word. That. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. Whatever you want me to do. If I make less money. If I have less influence. If I have less prominence. Or if I have more. I just want to be in the center of your will. Spirit of the living God. Would you guide me? What do you want from me? God says I want that. And David says that to his son. More than anything else I want from you, I want to charge you with my very last words. Walk in the ways of God. Know the success that comes from the approval of heaven. I charge you with my dying breath. Stand up. Be strong. And prove yourself a man.